Welcome to Wisdom from Our Neighborhood. Wisdom from Our Neighborhood is a program of Paths to Understanding, which is formerly Neighbors in Faith and the Tracy Levine Center. Our mission is to bridge bias and build unity through multi-faith peacemaking, through inspiring stories, nurturing relationships, and acting together for the common good. In this episode, uh, the how and why of interfaith is a part of Interfaith Week sponsored by Holden Village and Paths to Understanding. We will have six nights of live webinars starting Sunday, July 19th, and ending on July 24th. Webinars will include interfaith conversations on the topic of us, them, and all, weaving our identities and common humanity within the unity of life. You can register for those live webinars at www.holdenvillage.org. So with us today, we're so happy to have uh, Catherine Laurie, the assistant to the presiding bishop of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, an executive for ecumenical and interreligious relations and theological discernment. From 2012 to 2013, Lori served as the president of the National Council of Churches USA, the first Lutheran and youngest women ever to serve in that position, and edited the book, For Such a Time as This, Young Adults on the Future of the Church. We also have with us Moses Pinamaka, who's a Lutheran the a theological seminary a professor, a part of California Lutheran. He believes that education empowers people. Theological education not only empowers, but also has the power to transform us. Also today with us, Rabbi Alana Seskin, who's an educator, an activist, and a writer. She's an editor of the progressive blog, JewSchool.com. She served as assistant rabbi at Adas Israel in Washington, DC. She reaches across faith traditions to fight Islamophobia and anti-Semitism, and is the co-founder of the Pomegranate Initiative, She's also an Orthodox rabbi. So thank you all for being here. So, um, so Catherine, uh, you know, we're gonna start off with this question, why is interfaith work necessary and important? And I'd love to hear what you have to say about that. Thanks, Terry. It's so fun to join you and my new colleagues here. And thanks to Paths to Understanding and Holden Village for this opportunity. Uh, as I said to you earlier, it's extraordinary to be engaging in this interfaith conversation through virtual means in the most um, uh, in the most special way possible as we're all um, sheltering in place and finding our way through um, the various pandemics that our society is experiencing. And so with that, um, let me just share that one of the reasons um, why I think interfaith work is so necessary and, and important is precisely because of our context. So I reference those pandemics we're seeing not only COVID-19, but also racism and white supremacy really having a stranglehold on our society, um, but also the longer term um, chasms of difference, uh, religious difference, um, anti-religious bigotry and violence that have plagued not only our context here in the United States, but also globally for so long. And so one of the key reasons I think interfaith work is so necessary and important is because um, as people of faith, we can be bridge builders. We can work together to um, offer a counter narrative, if you will. Um, and, and that helps me to transition to the second reason. We are bridge builders on the basis of our sacred texts and scriptures. Um, any, any of us can turn to our scriptures and find those places where we are called um, to, um, to be peace builders, to be peacemakers, to seek justice, um, to um, reach out in right relationship to each other and to all of creation. When, we, um, when those of us in the Christian tradition think about what does it mean when Jesus um, commands us and calls us to love our neighbor, we reflect on that in light of our multi-religious context so that we understand our neighbor to not just mean other Christians, but all of our neighbors. And um, in the Lutheran tradition, we really talk about this as vocation. Um, the theologian uh, Martin Luther really um, had an affinity for the concept of vocation, how we understand our calling. And, um, and I wanna um, return to that later in our conversation, but just placehold it here. And then thirdly, another reason why I think interfaith work is necessary and important is because we all know that our reality is multi-religious. Whether we live in uh, big cities or in rural areas or somewhere in between, 
all of us are living lives where we encounter daily um, people of other religions and worldviews, people whose opinions um, may be different from ours, people whose lives are different than ours and commitments are different than ours. And so that context actually really requires us to engage in multi-religious, multi-faith work. Um, that is the response that we're called to give. Wow, thank you, Catherine. And Alana, I would like you to engage the same question. Um, why is interfaith work necessary and important at this point? Sure, thank you so much for inviting me here tonight also. Um, so I would agree with a great deal of what's already been said. You know, we've been seeing a rise in violence and hatred, not just in the US, but around the world and not just in the past five years, um, although in the U.S. there's specifically been a rise in violence against Muslims and Jews, as well as against immigrants and African Americans during this past period. Interfaith work is a way to fight that rise of hatred, um, and religious communities have a potentially powerful role to play for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, when people of, interact with diverse faiths while being with their own faith tradition, it allows people to safely make connections with peoples of other faiths. They can learn about it without it being threatening. Um, if their pastor or rabbi or imam or priest is there guiding the conversation in a group of their friends, it allows people to access the beauty of other traditions while also being firmly embedded in their own. The faith leaders of these communities are able to model the behavior that we want. And that's actually also why it's important for these kinds of you know, programs and interactions to not just be a one-off program, but to be relationship building communities should see their leaders interacting over time and building friendships. Um, in my tradition, we have the idea of access to God as God is a palace or in a palace to which one can enter through many different doors. And I like to expand that metaphor and add that it's not merely entering through different doors, but also that the rooms of the palace can be different dwellings for us. You know, some people like to hang out in the kitchen and cook, and some like to play pool in the basement, and some are out on the deck barbecuing, and somebody's making music in the living room. And the best parties allow the introverts in the kitchen to bring their fantastic cakes to the musicians in the living room and listen to the music and watch the folks in the ballroom dance to the music, you know, et cetera. In other words, each of us with our own religious faiths can be strengthened by learning about other faiths, um, you know, in, in a way that is syntonic with our own traditions. And I'd also add, you know, by joining together interfaith to do this work, we please our creator who made us all. And not just leaders, but when the communities join together to fight the hatred, the communities are modeling the behavior. And until the day comes when the world's in a state of perfection, there's always going to be fighting over resources. But by learning from one another and developing relationships between faith communities, we can undermine conflicts that purport to be religious in nature when really they're political. Political conflicts can be resolved diplomatically. Religious conflicts can't. And so it's extremely important for us to make sure that those with agendas don't set us against one another on the false basis of an irreconcilable difference, which I don't actually believe exists, religiously speaking. And finally, just in sort of the context of right now, I'd add that religious unity also has a critical role to play in racial conflicts. Our faiths all tell us that no human is less than another. And in a time when racism is in ascendancy, religion has a really strong role to play in fighting it. No one should allow their sister or brother in faith to go unchallenged if they assert some form of supremacy. And interfaith work helps us support one another in speaking out. Thank you so much, Alana. And Moses, I'd love to hear from you about the how and why of interfaith. Thank you, Terry, and to Paths of Understanding and also Holden Village for this wonderful opportunity for this conversation. Uh, and thanks to Catherine and Alana for your thoughts on this um, uh, point. Interfaith work is important and necessary for enlightenment of our being to be fully human, of our own being to experience the divine mystery, and of our own well-being to be harmonious communities, not homogeneous, but harmonious communities of faith, culture, and life in all its fullness. I also like the word life in its abundance. I want to trace two scenarios. When I think of um, uh, interfaith, I always uh, wonder, I grew up in India, which I, I feel is a cradle of many faiths, a manger for, as an example, manger of many faiths. 
And I am a science graduate, but I studied Indian history, especially the history of independence from British Empire. What intrigues me always is uh, we as a nation practiced nonviolence and fought um, for our freedom against the British Empire. But we, the same people, started fighting and killing each other the moment we were divided as two nations, India and Pakistan. I always wondered why the same people who had lived and in nonviolence and suddenly became so violent. The second one is uh, one of my students who works at a YMCA camp, you know, most of the YMCA camps are very diverse. Um, she used to share with us how the small children in those camps uh, already have their identity as the faith from which they come from and they try to build alliances or uh, find uh, their own groups or you know, play with their own groups and talk, have conversation and learn from others as well. This makes me to reflect on a play school. And I was just thinking how, if you visit a daycare center, a play school in, for example, Berkeley, California, where at least some, if not all, uh, you see a lot of diversity. Children, black, white, brown, yellow, play, sing, dance, and learn. When they start um, as children, they do all of that without any problem. But once they start talking, when they start making claims, saying, my book, my toy, my mom, my table, then there is already some um, claim that creates some tension and some competition. And these exclusive claims, um, when they create the tension, the teachers try to pacify by encouraging them to share and not fight and all of that. But when they grow up, when they grew up and realized that they are similar in some ways and not similar in other ways, how they look, what they eat and how their parents look, they start um, making their own bias. Some of them remain as implicit bias. Um, but those bias are challenged by their parents sometimes or complemented by their parents, families, and communities. I'm, I, I place this just as an example to say how similar things can have be seen in the societies we live. People of all colors, faiths, cultures live together without problems to certain extents or until there is a question about our identities, our privileges, our rights. And it, that is true when it comes to our faith. When we have to share our faith narratives and make assumptions, uh, claims based on our implicit bias, then there is the, this tension that leads to so much of um, you know, unrest or violence Whereas it can, the, the, those tensions can be addressed in a way that we can develop mutual um, respect. We can develop compassion and we can be open to our neighbor's faith and other worldviews. That will enhance our own understanding. That will enlighten us and realize us, uh, make us realize uh, to be fully human. So I strongly believe that interfaith work is important and necessary for enlightenment of our own being to be fully human, of our own being to experience God, the divine mystery, and of our own well-being to be harmonious communities of faith, culture, and life in all its abundance. Thank you so much, Moses. You know, I, I know for myself, I was raised... Um, as I've said in other contexts, in, in a kind of white Christian supremacy um, in a small town. I grew up in a very different place than you. I grew up in a town where there were, uh, there were Roman Catholics and there were Methodists and, and then there were Lutherans. <laughs> and that was pretty much it. And, and I remember in Sunday school once, uh, I think at fourth or fifth grade, asking if, if there were still Jewish people in the world. <laughs> because we had basically been taught in Sunday school that that the Hebrew tradition was just a forerunner <laughs> for for the Christian tradition, um, and and of course 
you know, the answer was something along the lines of, you know, uh, only by mistake, really. It was, it was, <laughs> it was, it was really it seemed like that. And then I remember once as a, as a little kid watching on Sunday morning, uh, the, a TV show that was run by the founder of this organization um, and that had a rabbi, a, a priest, and, and also a Protestant pastor, actually Lutheran, um, on having conversation. And I, and I pointed to the show because it came on after the Davy and Goliath show on Sunday mornings. And, uh, and my dad said, oh, stop watching that. That will confuse you. <laughs> you know, and so um, I really grew up in a place where we didn't have much conversation with or even exposure to. Um, and, and, and in which a kind of a, a Christian white supremacy was, um, was really assumed. And, uh, and then, of course, I began to, to, to grow as a pastor and as a person and begin to think more deeply about the, the heart and soul of the, the Abrahamic traditions and begin to think about what monotheism was trying to do. Um, it was in part an attempt to help us recognize other people as human, even if their culture was different, even if their their religious tradition was different, if, if their food was different, and so on. And 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 so that really begins to began to help me struggle with this sort of upbringing uh, of really kind of a, a kindly, mostly, but not always so kind, uh, Christian white supremacy, and then to realize that the very heart of the tradition that I'd been raised in was actually in part to help us recognize the humanity, the dignity, and the gifts that other traditions and other cultures have to offer. And it's been, it's been a, a big journey for me to kind of make that, to, to, to walk that path. And there have been so many instances where I've had to recognize both the beauty of, of the upbringing I had, but, but also some of the, the potential dangers of it. And I think about all the challenges that we're experiencing right now with with uh, in Western Washington, for instance, it's said that, that 2 million people will be moving into Western Washington in the next 30 years. And that means that there are gonna be people from all over the world, from many different cultures and subcultures, uh, moving into smaller towns. And, and I think, you know, for, for my part, um, we're gonna be doing a lot of our work trying to help smaller communities learn to recognize their neighbors as human beings and as partners in building and forming their community. And I think interfaith work is a great way into, um, as both of you, as many of you have said, while still having your identity and your values, um, making one of those values, the value of, of recognizing the humanity of other people and the value of partnering with them for a, a, a more um, prosperous and thriving world. Um, so for me, that's that's a lot of what I see around around interfaith, and 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 so I, I'm going to, I guess, at this point, just take a, a, a shorter period of time and talk about what are some of the impediments um, in our in, in the United States, uh, especially uh, for interfaith work. What are some of the the obstacles that must be overcome? And I'd be interested, Alana, in asking you that question. Sure. Um, I mean, actually, it's funny, you raised one of them, um, with, which is supersessionism. I mean, that's particularly around Judaism, which is my background, of course. Um, <clears throat> and I think, you know, uh, in my own work with Pomegranate Initiative, one of the things we do is go to places where there aren't very many Jews or Muslims and uh, probably not many Hindus either or Buddhists either. Um, you know, because sometimes people, there's, you know, there's, there's different kinds of um, ignorance, right? There's sort of an innocent ignorance, which is you learn things, but you're not, there's nothing malicious about it. And there's, there's a story that I like to tell. Um, when I was in Spain on vacation many years ago, uh, I was traveling through Spain and we ended up going up to the, um, the border with Portugal to a small town. And we were staying with ba basically the daughter and son-in-law of sort of like the traditional headmen of the town, like for, you know, generations. And they were so curious that we were, I don't even remember how it came up that we were Jewish, but they were just so curious about it because they'd heard, I guess in church or whoever, what somebody told them that Jews had horns and hooves. And we were kind of like, all right, that's cool. You can look, you know, and we'll take off our hats, take, you know, take a, take a gander. You can see there's no like scars or anything like that. And, you know, it's not like, it wasn't malicious in any way. That was just they'd never met a Jew, you know, and I, I, you know, there's probably, we all have, you know, these sort of ideas about people, which 
they, you know, they aren't necessarily malicious. They're just, we've never questioned them because we've never had the experience of interacting with somebody. Now, the flip side of that, of course, is sometimes they are malicious, right? So, you know, white supremacy can be, you know, uh, the fact that you're surrounded by people who are white and Christian can lead you to have odd ideas about Jews, which may just be like, oh, we have these weird ideas, but they can also, they can also take a dangerous turn where, you know, like there's the idea that, you know, the Jews are Christ killers. Um, and so, you know, we need to be, you know, removed or killed or sent away, or we're not really citizens or, you know, um, there's sort of this idea that, there, you know, there's a dual loyalty. We're not really loyal to our own country or, you know, something like that. All of these sort of mythos that go around, you know, immigrants or other faiths than the one you're used to. So that can be a, that can be a big border to cross. Like that can be very difficult for people, particularly if it's something that they grew up hearing, but they never really thought about it. You know, it becomes so embedded in your worldview that it's very hard to, to root it out. Um, and really the only way to do that is, as you say, through these relationships. Uh, Catherine, would you be willing to share a little bit about what you think are some of the hindrances or impediments to interfaith work? Yeah, well, in addition to what Alana shared, which I think is spot on, um, I, I would add um, that one of the big hindrances is that people have the wrong idea about what interfaith actually is. And they're deeply concerned that in order to participate in it or engage with people of other religions and worldviews, they have to give something up. They have to compromise who they are. They have to set aside their beliefs or their convictions in order to, um, you know, reach some sort of lowest common denominator. And um, and that, of course, I think um, is is not what any of us uh, here or in our networks mean by interfaith or interreligious work. Um, one of my mentors in, in this work is um, uh, my former professor, Diana Eck, um, and I worked with her for many years at the Pluralism Project, and I really appreciate that she disrupted this by providing uh, people with very simple language of engagement. That, um, that religious pluralism in, in her definition is about engaging people across difference and not forsaking who we are or setting aside our convictions. It's that two-way street that I think all of us have experienced in our lives um, and in our work where you enter into interreligious relations and you don't set aside or give up anything, but you actually gain something, both in terms of um, what you learn about your neighbor but also what you learn about yourself. I can say I can, I've can. i learned much more about what it means to be a Christian in the Lutheran tradition through interreligious relations than I did through the excellent catechesis and formation I received growing up. Because you have to learn to articulate what your beliefs and convictions are to your neighbor in a way um, that helps um, everyone at the table understand what both the common similarities are and the common convictions, um, but also where those important differences are too. Yeah, Moses, what do you have to say? Yeah, I appreciate what uh, Alana and Catherine uh, shared. Um, I feel uh, a lot to do with the teachings of the church uh, because I have within my family, uh, my, my, my family, some of my family members who make exclusive claims and think to learn about other faiths is almost like, as Catherine said, uh, to compromise with your own uh, commitment to Christ. Uh, but that's not the case. And I know um, I take my students to visit temples, the synagogue or the, uh, or, uh, the Gurudwara. And I have one student who never even wanted to step into um, a temple or a synagogue because he was taught to make an exclusive claim that he's he has to um, profess his faith very loyal to Christianity and commitment to Christ, nothing else. Everything else will be uh, blasphemy or everything else will be like compromising. So a lot to do with the way um, we teach uh, our people in the churches. Um, when I take an opportunity to talk about other faiths and other perspectives whenever I can in, when I preach. Um, a lot can be done and there is there are some people who are already open to learn and willing to embrace other faiths and learn from the others. 
but oftentimes we, we we curtail that through our teachings. So that I see as one of the impediments uh, for interfaith work. Yeah, thank you all. And I, I just, you know, I, I guess I've already sort of shared on this question around some of the, the exclusivist claims, which, um, uh, which, uh, which, you know, f through Christian white supremacy, you know, that sort of mask themselves as, as the ultimate in faithfulness. Um, but then as you, as you dig into the Christian scriptures, you begin to see Jesus interacting with people from different traditions who were all around him, uh, Samaritans, Syrophoenicians, uh, Romans, and others. And, and uh, of course, in the, in the famous story in Luke 10 of the Good Samaritan, which, you know, I bring up all the time as an example of Jesus telling a positive story about people of a, of a somewhat different tradition um, and how that tradition um, helped to form a human being willing to stop in a dangerous situation out in the wilderness and, and take a person uh, who had been injured and actually care for them and bring them back to health and, and even offering to pay for their medical care. Um, Jesus tells that story about how that tradition was capable of producing human beings who were not only sort of made in the image of God to begin with, but recognized the image of God in others. And I just think there's so much in, in the Christian scripture that, that just I, I, as a kid, was never taught. Like, this passage from, from Acts chapter 10 here, uh, Peter says, uh, truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears God and does what is right is acceptable to God. Um, that was a passage that was just skipped over as something that could not be understood. <laughs> you know? um, and so we often don't understand like the very roots. And, and I, I guess lastly, I just wanna say that I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about what monotheism is out there. Um, I think we've, we, we sort of teach a lot of times in Christian churches mono-religionism, that there's only one religion that, that, that has an interaction with, with God. <laughs> um, and, and, but monotheism is very different, that there's one creator that helps us to see the humanity of all people. And I think what's happened fundamentally in our, in, 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 in white Christian supremacy, you know, in the United States at least, is that um, is that we've turned monotheism into into a kind of uh, uh, a new kind of tribalism? Um, we we sort of see um, ourselves as having the only route or understanding of or, or or even aspiration to God. And I think that the Abrahamic tradition was trying to help us to see the humanity and welcome the insight of people from all different traditions. And, and so I'm, I'm concerned that we've, we've sort of retribalized monotheism and turned it into monoreligionism, which in the Christian, in the Abrahamic traditions is really idolatry <laughs> whenever you think you got God figured out, you know. So there's, there's so many different pieces there. Um, but, but so as we start to do interfaith work, um, what are some of the hows? Like, what are some of the things that are important for us to do in terms of the practice of interfaith work? And, and this time I'd like to start with you, Moses. Thank you, Terry. Um, for me, interfaith work is so much based on the narratives. The narratives, um, Catherine talked about counter narratives, narratives of life experience, mm -hmm. worldviews, uh, spirituality, and especially when I, when I think of spirituality, I want to start with the spirituality of indigenous people and the people of um, islands. In, in Oceania, you know, I taught a course um, uh, on faith and cultures in Asia and Oceania. And when I look at the people on the small islands, Micronesia, Melanesia, Polynesia, the islands had their own culture. But of course, that some of it was um, wiped out, um, erased by the, 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 the colonization. Uh, but when I look at indigenous people, uh, people living on islands, their spirituality, their experience, their narratives are so important uh, for me to do um, uh, interfaith work. The, their sense of connection with the ancestors, connection with the land and creation is very deep. It's very deep. I appreciate and I've learned a lot of um, 
uh, lot about my own uh, faith tradition when I learned from the spirit, the spirituality of the indigenous people, Amer Native American or American Indian, Alaska Native, and island dwellers. Um, I'm seeing this especially because there is so much of scholarship already available. There are so many of resources of scholarship, literature, art, and spiritual practices, spiritual rituals that we can engage in. Just to quote uh, two resources that I really appreciate, Nostra Estate, Lat, you know, which is in our times, uh, the declaration on relations of the church with non-Christian religions of uh, the Second Vatican Council, that is a document that described, that has an agenda, very clearly spelled out agenda, how to work, engage in interfaith or interreligious work. And for Lutherans, we have recently, uh, we have from conflict to communion, Lutheran, Catholic, uh, common, um, uh, the resource for commemoration of um, Reformation in 2017, the report from the Lutheran Roman Catholic Commission on Unity. There are so many such resources that are already written. But when I look at those, I want to see what about those communities that don't have the written uh, resources. So we really need to begin with, uh, begin from listening to these narratives of life experience, worldviews and spirituality of indigenous people, American Indian, Alaska Native, and people of the islands in Oceania and other parts. So that is uh, how I learned uh, to do the multi-faith work uh, with, the, with my own experience, my own life journey of interfaith work, and uh, how I teach um, interfaith engagement and leadership today. Thank you, Moses. And, and Catherine, I wonder if you would share a little bit about what you've learned about how to do interfaith work. Thanks. I, um, I'm going to use a couple slogans, if you don't mind. I want to go back to what um, I think all of us have pointed to, but especially Moses with the, um, with the wonder that children bring and what we can learn from, from children. The first slogan I want to suggest helps us um, think about how, how to do interfaith work is uh, just do it. Just do it. I think about my earliest interreligious um, experiences. They were my closest friendship with, um, with my classmate, Emily. And the reason why we were bonded so closely was because her dad was the local rabbi and my dad was the lo local pastor. And we bonded over what it meant to be children growing up in, in different but similar circumstances of, of, of what religious leaders um, are in a community. Um, and, and I didn't think about that as an interreligious relationship until I had a frame on it much later in life. But I think, you know, just do it. Just go ahead. Know that we're human. We're all going to make mistakes. We're going to um, be insensitive toward one another. We're going to be exclusive at times because we can help each other to see the broader frame, to, um, to see the, a more inclusive vision when we allow ourselves and become vulnerable to learn from one another. Uh, the second slogan I want to lean on is um, an adaptation of the real estate slogan, location, location, location. Um, let's think about our location and our context, but really think about relations, relations, relations. Um, when people are at the center of how we think about doing interfaith work, um, that for me is the best way forward. So whether it's those personal friendships, like I mentioned with my dear classmate, Emily, or with the people in our community where we're trying to seek justice um, on a particular social issue, if we put people at the center, if we um, are vulnerable at the same time, I think we're going to learn a lot. And then I want to underscore what I think um, you, Terry, um, have shared and, and Moses and Alana have certainly underscored, and that is how do we decenter Christian voices and leadership in the movement. For those of us who are Christian, there has to be discipline around that. There has to be um, 
uh, continually asking ourselves to see where um, where that isn't happening and where we might need to step back and create space for others um, and where we might not need to be driving the invitations or the setting the table and so on. Um, so I would lift those three gems up from um, both what I've learned from mentors and from my interreligious companions in this journey. Thank you, Catherine. How about you, Alana? So, I mean, I would, uh, I'd I've definitely gotten a lot from what Moses and Catherine already have said, and I'm just going to add three very short things. Um, the first is I would say there's a, a, something I actually learned from an evangelical minister who's a, a good friend. Um, met way, way back when I first met him, we were uh, doing a, a trip together um, with uh, a number of other religious uh, heads of figures. So it was the two of us and a pr uh, Catholic priest and um, an imam. It, it was a lovely group. And we were chatting in the back and we were talking about sort of the idea in Christianity that, you, you know, you spread the gospel and, you know, sort of the, the idea about, you know, wanting to convert others. And that, you know, it, there's a certain, uh, that, you know, like many Jews find that very intimidating, you know, like to have the majority culture try and convert you is, um, can be very difficult. But in a certain, you know, from, from the Christian perspective, of course, it's an act of love because you want to share what you have. And the thing that my friend said was, which I, you know, have taken to heart is something which is useful for all of us, not just for, you know, for Christians who are trying to spread the gospel, which is to have a certain amount of humility um, that, you know, of course, you, we, we each believe in our tradition because we think it's true, but that also we might be wrong. And actually, you know, it's, um, there's a, there's a, um, a very famous uh, religious commentary named Rashi Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki, who actually says, "Teach yourself, to, teach your tongue to say, I do not know," right? And and I think that that's um, it's a very wise wise thing to do. Probably no matter what the, <laughs> what the context is, whether it's religion or something else. Um, so I guess humility would be the first piece. I might be wrong. I could be wrong. Someday I'll find out. Not yet. God willing. Um, and the second thing I, I would say is to um, talk about uh, is relationship, that relationship is really the key to doing interfaith work. And, you know, like the fact that I was able to have this conversation um, with this person while I'm sitting in a car, we you know, we were traveling around for a couple of weeks and that gave us the opportunity to have those conversations that um, allowed us to be vulnerable and allowed us to, you know, in a, in a larger context of building a friendship that you could have these conversations where you can say difficult things. And that would be the third piece, which is to talk about the difficult things, right? A lot of interfaith groups are very focused on finding similarities and on talking about how much we have in common and forget to recognize that actually there are things that we don't have in common and that we're never going to agree on. And I think that that's okay. It, it, we don't have to agree on everything. We can think the other person is, wrong or incorrect and that doesn't make them bad and also that sometimes it's going to be really difficult to talk about things so you know certainly in jewish muslim context um israel palestine comes up fairly often but you can't not talk about those things you might not want to talk about them the first day perhaps you might want to wait but once you build that relationship it's really important to have those conversations you know, I think one of the one of the challenges, um, you know, for so I was I've been out doing a lot of work in, in more rural areas as well, and and you know one of the th one of the ways I approach folk who 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 have a very strong sense of wanting to convert other people and make them make them Christian, you know, um, is I try to really affirm the fact that they feel like God has found them, like that they have that, that God loves them as they are, and um and, and I and I just say you know well. You know, is it really right for us to to limit how God chooses to find people? And in the Lutheran tradition, we don't really believe that we find God. We find we believe that God finds finds human beings. God makes that connection, and and that's often helped people. You know, so I'm glad I, I tell them that you have that strong connection and that you believe God made that connection with you. And and maybe maybe you know God make God makes that connection. You know, in 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 the ways that work for other people. Um, who, who may need it differently than you. And, and part of that then goes back to, you know, what, what does Jesus mean when he says, go make disciples of all nations? Well, we know in Greek that word 
go make disciples of all nations could easily be translated, go make disciples among all nations. So a passage that's intended to, to open up the, the tradition to people of all nations is translated of and makes it sound like we've got to do something to everybody. And, uh, and so there's just so many passages in, in, in the, the translation of the Greek New Testament, you know, that, that, that really can be read a little bit differently. I think in terms of, of interfaith work, you know, my, for some of my career, I perceived it to be mostly about people talking to each other. And I, I think now there's a real, a real sea change that's been taking place for some time around interfaith work being about, you know, yes, it's good to know about other faith traditions. It's really important to, but it's even more important to get to know people and have relationships with folk of different, different wisdom traditions. And that that's like exponentially more powerful than just knowing. But then even more powerful than that is when we work together based on shared values for the common good. Like that's when it really cracks open because then we see that the Buddhist and the Hindu and the Jewish person and the, and the, the, uh, the Muslim community really are willing to put themselves out there to help build the community that ends up supporting all of us. And I, I think when we see that kind of movement, um, you know, something really shifts. And then the other piece that I, I would just add really quickly is that I, I, I want to encourage people who do interfaith work to do it in public. So, you know, what I, what I say to, to, to groups of, of wisdom communities that are gathering for the first time in small towns is just keep it really simple. Once a year, get together, eat and share stories. Once a year, get together and do a service project of some kind. And maybe you can do more later, you know, uh, more rigorous kind of stuff later. And then once a year, march in the parade together. Or once a year, you know, be, be at the food festival uh, for the community uh, together. And when people see people of different traditions coming together, just something cracks open there. Um, even for folk that, that don't find themselves or don't uh, see themselves as particularly religious. Um, all of a sudden seeing people who are so different and committed to their differences also committed to their commonalities. And, and to the community and something something really shifts you know then um, yeah if I could um, I just want to reflect that you have maybe with or without knowing that you were doing it <laughs> I'm not sure you have beautifully <laughs> summarized the the core the essence of the brand new policy statement on interreligious relations that the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America adopted last summer um, the entire policy statement rests on these two legs of seeking mutual understanding. So again, that two-way street and cooperation for the common good. And I just, I love what you've said and the, and the public dimension you've added to that puts um, all of the, the 12 commitments in that policy statement really beautifully in perspective. So I just wanted to pause and appreciate what you have done with or without knowing that you were doing it. <laughs> well, I did read that document and I so appreciated it. And I think, I think I sent you an email at that point when I got it like, this is great. Because I think it does give us a, a roadmap out of just the conversational piece, but into moving into the world together to make it better. And, and I, I so appreciated all that work there. And, and so I, I just like to, to kind of like next, next question here is, is kind of go to the heart here you know, why is this work important to you? And, and, uh, and so Catherine, would you be willing to share, like as a person, like why are you engaged in this work? Sure. So I, I went all the way back to my childhood and I mentioned Emily um, and let me, let me begin there. So I, I, I um, then uh, wrestled in, in um, high school and in college with both um, uh, trying to discern my own vocation and my absolute joy and appreciation for learning about the rich diversity God has given all of us to enjoy and to appreciate. Um, I found myself as a young adult serving on the delegation at the World Council of Churches Assembly. And um, I sat there, this was in the mid-2000s, and I sat there and I stared at the logo for the World Council of Churches which is the outline of a ship. And this ship, um, it may be familiar to you, Terry, and, and to you, Moses, it's, it is the symbol of the ecumenical movement. 
Um, and the, really the, 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 um, the logo can be summarized as, you know, we're all in the same boat, um, <laughs> sort of a, a mindset. Um, but I really wondered, what is that all about? And then it had the Greek word oikumene. And I did what all good young adults do when, when they want to learn something. And I Googled it. And I suddenly found myself down a rabbit hole learning about what this concept of oikumene meant and what it meant in the context of Roman Empire and so on. But really, if you, if you boil it down, it talks about the whole inhabited earth. And I remember sitting in that assembly hall and having this epiphany that really my, my call, my, my sense of vocation was so clearly in understanding what it means to be Christian in the whole inhabited earth, um, meaning the earth with all of its rich diversity, its diversity of religions, its diversity of creatures and creation, and that this was my life's joy. And so I, I really, um, I have claimed that for myself. I have, um, I have been eager to engage in that vocation with others who are coming with a different sense of call as well. But really, for me, the daily motivation to do this work is in what I see in my four children. Um, I have children who range in age from four to 12. And they are growing up um, not only with one dear friend named Emily who happens to be Jewish. They are growing up in a religiously diverse context that I can't fathom. And they are learning daily what it means to navigate um, this rich diversity. And they are already at early ages reflecting on what that also means for them as, as children who are becoming disciples in the Christian tradition. So that is my motivation, really, to help them uh, and, and to also engage myself in building a world that's more peaceful and just, where all of human difference and the, and the um, beautiful diversity of all of creation is celebrated and, and we can really um, enjoy that and, and, and engage in it together. So I, I would name those as my motivations, Terry. Thank you, Catherine. And Moses, uh, what, what is it that makes you, leads you to do this kind of work? Thank you, Kateri. I'm glad, Catherine, you talked about the boat. Uh, I remember sitting on a boat in Varanasi uh, on Ganges River uh, when we attended the uh, World Council of Churches uh, Conference on Interfaith Dialogue, Hansuko and uh, the NCCI, National Council of Churches in India, and we all participated in that. Uh, we had devotion in that boat by Ganges in Varanasi, where you could see people, Hindu, my fellow Hindu devotees, taking the ritual bath, where you, I could see the carbs being cremated and pushed into the Ganges. The Ganges uh, with full of flowers and everything that you can name. <laughs> floating on the water and in, sitting there in the middle of the, the, the river, we had morning devotions. And I had the, the privilege to engage in so many um, events like that. But when I think of uh, how I'm inspired to do this, um, I would say my parents, my call to be a religious leader, my theological education, and uh, I'm glad um, Rabbi um, Alana mentioned about the humility, how I heard and learned to be humble, to learn from other experiences. I will very quickly say, you know, my parents, my mother was a teacher, Nirmala is her name, and she um, taught us a lot about the meaning and significance of Hindu Muslim festival cultures, because as a teacher, she was part of the naming ceremonies and other rituals. And her pupils, the children, the students used to bring her gifts. After going to the temple, they used to bring gifts to her because they need to revere the teacher. And so she taught us a lot. My father who read a lot, uh, he also used to teach us about uh, the theological, biblical depth of our Christian faith in relationship to Hindu, because he had many friends who are Hindus and they were always used to uh, read and discuss about it. And good thing I learned from him is he used to talk about Hinduism, Christianity and Islam without passing any judgment, without any uh, prejudice. 
that helped me never to judge other faith traditions, but to respect them. And then when I became uh, uh, accepted uh, to be a pastor and studied uh, religions in depth, that's also another thing. But my main uh, turnover came when I was doing my master's in theology in Bangalore. Uh, I studied with the Stanley's J. Samarta. He was uh, at World Council of Churches for 10 years, uh, leading the unit on um, interfaith dialogue. He wrote the book, One Faith, Many one Christ, many faiths, uh, many religions. And that he inspired me to do interfaith work. And because of his uh, motivation that he gave me, I did the comparison between Latin American liberation theology and Asian, um, Asian liberation theology. And one of my favorite theologians is Aloysius Pires. He's a Jesuit from Sri Lanka. And he was a scholar in Buddhism, Christianity and the Marxism as a social um, movement. <laughs> so in that book, he talks about in his introduction to a theology of Asian liberation theology, he says, Jesus was humble enough to be baptized in the Jordan of Asian religiosity and bold enough to die on the Calvary of Asian poverty. So that image of Jesus um, you also mentioned, Terry, um, being humble um, to be baptized by his cousin who is leading a totally different um, reform movement. And then his boldness to die on Calvary, you know, in a metaphorical way, Aloysius uh, Pires uses Jordan as Asian religiosity and Calvary as Asian poverty and Jesus um, as uh, the one who um, makes sense of his, um, lives with his humility and dies with his boldness. So that is also another uh, important um, motivation I have to do interfaith work. So I am grateful for my parents, my theological education, especially liberation theology in Asia, uh, that has so much uh, to do uh, how I enjoy and engage in interfaith work. And so I'm, I'm, so I'm not always going last. I, I think I'll, I'll go next here and, and, uh, and just say that um, I grew up in a family where, um, where we had a mother, uh, my mother had a disability. And I remember feeling very profoundly the kind of the distancing that people uh, engaged with toward our family. Um, and I, you, I could just feel that. And, and as a kid, I got bullied in school uh, because, uh, you know, it's not, of course, bullying is pretty common, but our family was sort of on the out a little bit uh, in our community. And, and so um, when I went to seminary and I learned really for the first time the role that Lutherans and Lutheran theology uh, had played in, in, uh, in the Holocaust, I remember going down to uh, to the to the refectory, you know, to the cafeteria, and sitting around, and we were all kind of just taking it in, and we all basically said to each other that if we saw a similar dynamic happen in our time, that we would we would strive to not be one of the quiet ones. Uh, but of course, you know, looking back now, I recognize that it was happening to all kinds of people at that point. It was happening to African Americans. It was continuing to happen to our Jewish neighbors and our Muslim neighbors and our Latinx neighbors and our LGBTQ neighbors, you know, but that's, that's part of the way we learn, right? Uh, a little bit. And, uh, and so a number of years ago, as I saw, um, as I got to know, just do some interfaith work with a Buddhist and a Muslim, I was invited to go uh, teach a, uh, uh, a, a class on kind of countering Islamophobia at a, at a military town about 20 miles south of where I am sitting right now. And I saw the level of, of hatred and I saw the level of fear and I saw the, the intense disinformation toward our Muslim neighbors. And that led me on a path, you know, now uh, to, to serve in the organization I'm currently serving, um, trying in part to counteract uh, Islamophobia and the hate groups that help promote it. Uh, but in that journey of, of doing that work, what I discovered was how Islamophobic I was. 
um, how racist I, I was and still am. Um, and yet, um, what I found in the middle of that work, uh, very painful work oftentimes, um, where after an event, I would ask, you know, how did I disadvantage you today to my Muslim, Muslim co-workers? And, you know, for the first 30, 40 times, they would say, well, Terry, here's how you disadvantaged us today. And I, I lost a lot of sleep, honestly, um, during those times to, to realize, like, even though I wanted to be a supportive uh, ally, uh, how much I had to learn. But I've also found my own humanity um, in the middle of that because, um, because they, they kept working with me. And, uh, and that, that journey really, I, I think, has been a wonderful blessing in teaching me how to, how to be human and to realize that part of being human is being in relationship um, with, with folk that, that have very different beliefs and stories and yet um, recognizing our common humanity in the middle of it. And so there's been a lot to learn and there's been a lot of heartache, but there's been an awful lot of joy as well. Um, Alana, how about you, sister? Um, <laughs> so, I mean, I guess this probably doesn't reflect all that well on me, but in a, in a certain sense, um, I just never grew out of being the middle school or saying, ah, it, the world just isn't fair. Um, <laughs> I mean, honestly, I've, I've always been, um, with the Yiddish, what they call for Brent, you know, on fire. Um, not literally, I mean, but, um, you know, just that, um, the world's unfair and I'm obligated to be involved in fixing it. And, you know, I think maybe even if I believed in nothing else at all, I'd believe that. And um, that's one piece of it. Another piece is, um, you know, that, so according to the Talmud, which is the compendium of commentary that is foundational together with the Hebrew scriptures, um, together they make up the Jewish, the basis of the Jewish legal tradition. It says that at least 36 and maybe as many as 46, depending on how you count them, um, times there are warnings in the Torah, in the Hebrew scriptures about how to treat the stranger. Uh, most of them are warnings about not oppressing the stranger, um, like the one in Exodus 23 that says, um, mm. a stranger you will not oppress because you know the heart of the stranger seeing that you were strangers in the land of Egypt. And, and I'm, always, I'm always moved by that particular phrasing, that you know the heart of the stranger, because it seems to me in a very real way that that, that is the experience of being Jewish. Um, and in fact, in Leviticus 25, the scriptures say so directly, that um, there's a warning there that the, you're never supposed to sell the land in perpetuity because ki li ha'aretz ki gerim v'toshavim atem imadi. The land is mine, says God, and you are strangers and you dwell with me. So if we take our tradition seriously, it's not only that most Jews can remember our immigrant parents or our, we were immigrants or our grandparents were immigrants. You know, it's only, not only that we can remember that experience of being different. And it's not only that most of us, in, in fact, nearly all of us in the US uh, actually most places in the world, live in places where we're vastly outnumbered by people who are different from us in one way or another. Um, about 2% of us in the U.S. are Jewish and about two-tenths of a percent of the world population. But even if we all lived in the land of our ancestors together and we were completely unused to being in the minority religiously, God is telling us that the experience of being the stranger, of knowing the heart of the other, that's, what, that's paramount to being a religious Jew. And um, in Deuteronomy 10, the Torah says not only do not, are you not supposed to oppress the stranger, but it says, you, you have to love the stranger because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. And right, like it's many of these places where it says don't oppress or love or what have you, you know, it, it ends with saying, you know, because I am the Lord your God or because you are strangers in the land of Egypt. And, you know, you you and I, says God, are strangers together, right? We're, we're in the world, but the world is, you know, it's, it's not really a place where you get to be part of the land. You aren't, you aren't part of the, the 
the larger world. You know, you have to separate yourself in a certain way. And, um, and I, I suppose growing up, my parents really tried to live those values. You know, I, I didn't grow up super religious. I mean, we were, we were reform and we were members of a synagogue and we went to religious school and, you know, things like that. But the thing that I remember most about my religious upbringing is not, not necessarily celebrating holidays, although we did that, obviously, but, but that my parents spoke about making sure people were paid fairly and about racial injustice and, you know, not even necessarily to make a point out of it. It was just part of like dinner time conversation. It's totally normal to talk about those things. When we went to the grocery store, you know, I can remember my father one time made a point of saying, we're not going to buy this because the, the company is a notorious union buster and people should have a wage that's fair. Um, so, I mean, I guess that's a piece of it too. And, and then just sort of, you know, the fact that we're 2% of the American population means that wherever we go, I mean, in a certain sense, all Jews are doing interfaith work all the time, right? Because we're surrounded by people, most of us, and, you know, there's some people who live in very Jewish communities, but most of us always live with other people. And so um, it, it's sort of something that we're used to doing. And I guess I'm just sort of being a little more extreme about it. And, and we're so glad you are out there, um, out there, sister. And I just, I just want to thank all, all three of you for joining us today uh, for this Holden Village and Pass to Understanding um, Interfaith Week. And, and I, I hope this, this conversation will help a, a lot of our uh, Lutheran sisters and brothers, but all those who are going to be a part of Holden Interfaith Week to, to think about how they can weave uh, their own uh, identity and common humanity um, uh, with those who who have different or perhaps have have no uh, different wisdom tradition, uh, and recognize that we can we can find our own humanity together. So Catherine Laurie and Alana Suskin and and Moses Penamaka, thank you all so much for joining us. And uh, I want to remind everybody, of course, that you know, we have on the Path to Understanding website at pathtounderstanding.org. Um, a, uh, a lot of TV programs. Uh, we have a, a Challenge 2.0 TV program hosted by, by Jeff Renner, also on our YouTube channel. Uh, continue to join us on our Facts Over Fear campaign to counter anti-Muslim bigotry. And just want to encourage you all in this time of the twin, twin, twin pandemic of COVID-19 and, and also kind of the, um, the, the increased consciousness around racial injustice and inequity and institutional and systemic racism. Uh, the, to be well and be calm and be good to your neighbors. Thank you so much for watching.